All right, well, we're going to start in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, but we are continuing. We are in week three of our series called Church of Impact. Moving forward, one of the things that God has showed me in moving forward in 2021 is that we as a church are going to embrace the identity of being a church of impact. That is not to say that we don't have impact. That's not to say that we are negating the fact that we are every single week, if not day, changing lives and seeing the kingdom expanded. It's that as a church of impact, we are asking God for more, more people to influence, more people to be able to share the message of Jesus with, more people that we can make disciples. And so as a church of impact, we are looking for more impact. And we saw in week one that we have three hopes We have three hopes here at Vine Fellowship for everybody that would walk through the door, particularly those that would call Vine their home. Our three hopes are first, that you would know Jesus, not just about Jesus or just receive the teachings of Jesus, not just the morality of Jesus, but the salvation of Jesus. Everything starts with that revelation and with that relationship Every promise, everything we have moving forward, our ability to worship and inspiration and grow in Christ starts with, do you know Christ as your Savior? And so our hope as a church is that everybody would know the saving grace of Jesus Christ. After that, we have this hope that you would receive your miracle. Now, a miracle is it's a catch-all term that really just means we believe that God is alive, we believe that God is active, and we believe that he is moving in the lives of his people. Your miracle might be different than somebody else's miracle. Somebody might need miraculous healing, somebody might need a new job, somebody might need a spouse, somebody might be praying for children, somebody might be praying for substance abuse, somebody might just be praying to have a family that will love them uh, in a church home that will include them. Everybody's miracle is different, but the point is that God is moving, God is active, and he is wanting to bless his people. So we believe that God is moving, and we want to see God move in your life. After that, once you've received Christ, once you've received your miracle, now we want to be a church that has influential people, influencers. And this is the third one, to go be an influence. And so this idea of influence and being an influencer is what we're going to spend more time on this week. I want to really expand the idea of being in influence because there's a lot of thoughts around that particular word and around that particular concept. Not to, uh, we're not going to get lost in this necessarily, but fairly recently in our culture, a, the job title of influencer has been given to people. This is an actual job title that people have now. You might be able to make videos on YouTube or on other social media platforms, start making things, but your job is to sell products or to have ideas, whatever it is. You are influencing the people that, you, uh, that are following you, and that is now this term called influence. And it is an amazing thing. Whenever I went to career day, there was nobody there telling me that I could make millions of dollars by just showing everybody what I ate that day. But... <laughs> Goodness me, I feel like, I mean, I'm glad God called me to this. I'm not saying I want to change tracks, but that's not a bad thing right there. You just, it's just saying. So we're not necessarily talking about when we say influence, getting social media followers, building your YouTube channel, though if you're called to that, we can use that for the glory of God. I want to talk about biblical influence and the ideas surrounding biblical influence and how it applies to every single one of our lives. Because frankly, at the end of the day, Not everybody can have a YouTube channel. Somebody has to watch those things. Okay, sorry. I shouldn't have got lost there. So 2 Corinthians chapter 10, this is where we derive the idea of influence, and we're going to be in chapter 13. So Paul is writing this letter. Before we get into it, he's writing this letter. This is the second letter that we have that he wrote to the Corinthian church. We think there's three, maybe even four letters that he wrote, but we have two of them. And how do you know that this is the second one that we have? Second Corinthians, excellent job. Just, we we got to celebrate what we can celebrate. Um, and so one of the themes going on in Second Corinthians, particularly in the back part of the book, is Paul had some critics. There were people that did not like Paul. He thought, uh, they thought that he should not be validated with the position of apostle like John or Peter or somebody like that. And some of the reason behind that is because He suffered a lot in his ministry. He had snake bites and shipwrecks, and people were trying to kill him all the time. And and so they wanted to use that as an invalidation for his ministry because a real man of God wouldn't suffer that way. Uh, But he explains that in chapter 12. Oops, sorry. I'm not trying to get lost there. 
Um, but in, in chapter 10, he is addressing these critics. And even in this chapter, he talks about this, this interesting thing that one of the things they didn't like about him is that he would write these letters and they are powerful and forceful and he's got these deep ideas and very corrective and, and almost like aggressively corrective, calling people sent out by name, all this kind of stuff. But it says whenever he was in person, he was almost shy. Like he wouldn't talk, he was quiet, he was very meek. And so they, 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 they just had a, a trouble with disconnecting going, who is this lion that was writing the letter and who is this lamb that stands before us? That, they didn't use those phrases, that's my paraphrase. But so he's addressing these critics. So the takeaway is not so much how to deal with critics as much as his justification for bringing correction to the Corinthian church. Because in 1 Corinthians, he was correcting some of their behavior. Well, here's the crazy thing. You guys are going to be shocked about this. But even when pastors try to help people by correcting their destructive behavior, people get upset. It's the strangest thing. You guys, I know, are different. But other people that I've talked to, they really don't like somebody telling them, hey, you probably ought not to do that thing. So he is now correcting them and giving justification for it. And, and so we're going to read starting in verse 13. But we will not boast beyond limits, but will boast only with regard to the area of influence God has assigned to us to reach even to you. For we are not overextending ourselves as though we did not reach you. For we were the first to come all the way to you with the gospel of Christ. We do not boast beyond limit in labors of others, but our hope is that your faith increases, our area of influence among you may greatly enlarge, be greatly enlarged, so that we may preach the gospel in lands beyond you without boasting of work already done in another's area of influence. Let the one who boasts boast in the Lord, for it is not the one who commends himself who is approved, but the one who who the Lord commends. So what Paul is saying in all of this is, I'm bringing correction to you because I started the church. I brought you the gospel in the first place. I'm the one that told you about Jesus. And so it is my job as your pastor to continue to correct you. A lot of you got real nervous when I started saying that. Like, what is pastor gonna say today? So I'm just explaining that's, that's the idea behind all of this. He's like, I, he said, I'm not making this up. I'm not overextending myself. I brought the gospel to you. That's why I should have influence in your lives. And my hope, he says, church, is that as I influence you, that you will influence others, and then the gospel can move beyond you to lands that, that doesn't have the gospel yet. And so there's a couple of principles that we can take away in 2 Corinthians about the idea of influence. And the first thing that we can take away is that influence is given, not taken. Influence is something that is given, not taken. There is an idea that some people have. They may not express it this way, but they believe that the way that they gain influence is by taking it from other people. My voice has to be louder than your voice because I want to take your influence. I want to take your attention. I want to take your ability to form your own opinion and force mine on you. And so there's this idea that the way that we grow in influence is that we have to force it or go beyond our limits and make people pay attention to what we're trying to do. But that's not the biblical model. Paul says influence is given, that the Lord gives influence, that we receive influence that God has given us. So the first thing is that influence is given, not taken. And this is something else with all of that. Every single one of us has been given influence because this is going to be one of our struggles as a church as we're trying to move into this area of impact and becoming influential is that some of us are laboring under the misconception that we have no influence that we have no ability to make change, to help. There is nobody that would possibly listen to us. Well, this is the definition of influence. This is what we're talking about. The capacity, the capacity to have an effect on the character, development, or behavior of someone or something or even the effect itself. So we're talking about influence and the idea of a capacity the ability 
to have an effect on people, their character, the development, or even their behavior. Another way that we might be able to think about influence and that you have influence is that there is a people that need you, a place where those people are, and a thing you're supposed to do. There's a people, there's a place, and there's a thing. That's how we think about influence. There are people that you know. There is a place where those people gather, and there is something that you can do to influence, to change, to affect character, development, or behavior of those people. So how do I know that every single person has been given influence? How do I know that Paul's not just up here going, well, I am Paul after all. First of all, he would never write that in a letter. But it's like, yeah, okay, pastor, I get it. Paul had influence. We know Paul had influence. He was special. There was something unique about him that allowed him to have influence. I'm just a regular person. I don't have influence. I didn't put the scripture up there, but it's 1 Corinthians 3, 9. And this story, I don't think I put it up there. I didn't put it up there. (laughs) Just making sure. Uh, But there's this story, some of you may have heard it before, where there were some arguments going on in the Corinthian church, again, these Corinthians, about some say, I'm from Apollos, and some say, I'm from Paul, and I'm from Peter. And then the super saints were like, well, I'm from Jesus. Like, okay, bud. We all know those folks. We love them dearly. Uh, but Paul's point is, look, we all have different jobs. Apollos has a job, I have a job, Peter has a job, and we all are working in this whole thing together. But in 1 Corinthians 3, 9, he says we are all fellow workers with God. That is one of the most amazing revelations that I had ever received in Scripture because I I had always thought about this idea that Well, God can do whatever he wants. God is, I mean, God literally made everything. He can do whatever he wants. But then I saw this in scripture and had somebody explain it to me. It's that, yes, God can do whatever he wants. But after creation, God has chosen that everything that's ever done on this earth, he does through and with people. Think about it. Well, we can go to Moses rescuing Israel out of Egypt. Does the God of the universe possess the ability to teleport everybody out of Egypt and send them over to the promised land? Yeah. Why go through the effort with the plagues and the sea and and the, why go through the effort? Because God has chosen to be a fellow worker with humanity and work through Moses. And we see this through the judges. We see this through the kings. We even see this through Christ. Why did God himself become a person if not to just prove that everything that he does on the earth, he's going to do alongside humanity? We are fellow workers with God. And I don't want to have this impression that God can't do anything or that God won't do anything. That's not what it is. It's that a loving God, our loving Father, wants us to come alongside him in his big plan. God has a plan for the universe. God has a plan for the whole world. He has a destiny set for this earth that he laid at the foundations and the beginning of the earth. And while we are here enjoying his creation, he has invited us into the master plan. This is what it means to be a fellow worker with God. And as a worker with God, we've been given a place to work, a people that need our help, and something to do that will help them. A people, a place, and a thing to do. And we call that influence. We have people that need us. We have places to go, and we have something that we can do to influence, to help the character, the development and the behavior of those that need God and are looking for more God and need God in the first place. So we've all been given an influence. And the other great thing about influence is that it can grow. Influence can grow. This was Paul's hope. This was a little bit why he was frustrated because he wanted to go to Corinthian, Corinth, start a church, and those 
Christians would get so on fire for what God was doing in Corinth that they would start making an influence in other cities. They could move beyond, and now the gospel's grown. Influence has grown. More people, more places, and ability to use my gift in more places. So influence grows. Next week, we're going to spend quite a bit more time understanding the supernatural principle that being faithful with little is how we grow in more. But I also want us to not be deceived. We don't earn or take influence. We're given influence. We're given influence. And that's what we're going to see more of next week. So part of also understanding how we influence is not just knowing that we have it, that there's people and that there's there's a place, but what are we supposed to do? And this is the gifting part of influence This is the the part that we need to know that because God has called us to do something, have influence, he's given us an ability to influence. See, God would never send us somewhere and not have us be capable of doing the thing that he's asked us to do. Use a great example. We had such an awesome time of worship, so I feel like I can use this as an example. When the Spirit's moving, we can worship, amen? Amen. It's easier to worship when Jeremiah knows how to play the keyboard, right? Just imagine he got up to the keyboard or piano, excuse me, keyboard, whatever it is. Whatever, whatever that thing is. And just goes, you know what? I don't know what any of these things do. Let's wing it. (laughs) Now, I'm not saying that he wouldn't find some beautiful chords and recreate the structure of Western music. (laughs) What I'm saying is that it's unlikely. Because Jeremiah is a perfect example of somebody who has been called to do something and has been equipped to do it. Amen? When you are called to go somewhere, when God has put something inside of you to go somewhere, some people to be with, he will give you everything that you need to succeed in that mission. If you need to be the person of peace, he'll give you peace. If you need to be the person with answers, he'll give you the answers. If you need to be a person that can just love, he'll give you the capacity to love. If he needs you to pray, he'll give you the ability to pray and see answers. If he needs you to just bake the best chocolate chip cookies that have ever existed, you will bake those cookies. We've already got some volunteers. (laughs) So this is one of the first things that we need to know about being a person of influence is that that includes you. You have influence, and God has called you, and he's equipped you for it. Now, we may not know what that circle is of influence. We may not know who those people are. We may not know where that place is. We got to discover it. We've got to know what our gifts are so that we can see can succeed there. But that doesn't change the fact that you too have been given a circle of influence. Well, what do we do in a more broad sense whenever we get to our circle of influence? How do we talk about this in in more general terms even because there are specific things that only you can do, but there are also some things that we as a church are called to do in each of our circles, each of our spheres of influence. So we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 4. And Ephesians chapter 4 is probably one of my favorite chapters in all of Scripture to teach through. It is just thick. It's just thick with good stuff. That's why people like pudding. It's just thick. It's just, ah, yes. Every bite's good. And that's, sorry, that's so graphic. And that's, that's, Ephesians, <laughs> that's Ephesians 4, just from start to finish. It's so good. And so the context that Paul is talking about as we're about to get into verse 11 is this idea of the unity of the body of Christ or the church. And he says this just extraordinary thing in verse 4. There is one body and one spirit, just as we're called to one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. It's just this awesome, 
like breaking all division in the church, breaking all arguments in the church. He's like, we have one God and one faith. We're baptized by one spirit because we're saved by one Lord. And it's just, ah, I love it. So as he's going on into verse 11, though, he starts talking a little bit more about the hope of the church and the influence of the church. So here we are in Ephesians 4, verse 11. And he, that's God, gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers. Pause there. I dare you not to read ahead. It's like, it's right there. I know. So he gave the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds. Some of your translations will say pastor and the teachers. Now, these are the church leadership gifts. These are the offices that are given influence over church bodies. I hold the title of pastor over the church, though I would say that these can also not just be titles, but but gift sets. And I'm more gifted as a teacher, but I hold the title of pastor. And look, there's all kinds of people that that grab these titles and unfortunately have have hurt some people's ability to read this stuff because they just walk around and go, well, I'm apostle whatever name they have. It's like, I'm, well, I'm bishop. No, that's not, that's not in there. It's, uh, it's, I'm prophet. I'm prophet so-and-so. You got to listen to every word that I say. I don't even know you. Who are you? These strangers will walk in off the street and go into a church and try to flex some authority because they've given themselves the title prophet. And I'm not trying to pick on anybody. I'm just saying when I was in sixth grade, I was sure I was going to become a professional basketball player, particularly in street-style basketball. Called myself DMAC because I was going to make it. Then I realized... I'm kind of short and slow. I can't do a layup even. So basketball wasn't for me, even though I titled myself (laughs) as DMAC, Court King, (laughs) pass me the rock. I'd probably drop it, honestly. But these are are, our gift sets that are here for the sake of the church. And so these are church leaders. These are people in leadership positions in churches. And so a lot of the ways that we would expect that next verse to go is to say, and he's given the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the shepherd, and the teachers to do everything. But that's not what it says. Let's go forward. And he's gave the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the shepherds, and the teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. The purpose of church leaders, those who have been given influence in the church, is not to do the work of the ministry, but to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. Every single revival, every single great awakening, every single growth, church growth that has happened in dynamic fashion, every single great move of God has one singular thing in common. It's not dynamic preaching. It's not a new way to do worship. It's not church structure. It's not organizations. It's not a book deal. There's one singular thing. It's not one denomination. It's not one formula for evangelism. There is one singular thing that is true in every single mighty move of God, and that is that it is the people of God that are passionate and motivated about what God is doing. It's when you as the church become passionate and motivated about what God is doing in your life and in this church that we start to see as a whole church our ability to influence and make impact change. It's whenever you are taking what's happening here and taking it other places and then taking people who are out there and bringing them here. The job of church leaders then is to equip. And I'm, like I said, I'm a teacher. This is just kind of what I do. I enjoy it. I'm gifted in it. And so then there's this idea that says, you know, I've got a cousin that they're coming over for dinner in, in like a week and, and I know they need Jesus. I wish I, I just wish I was more confident in telling them about the process of salvation, the process of salvation. The evangelist can teach you this. It's like, man, there's people at my work, they are, they are just, ooh, they are, 
I'm glad Jesus loves them because it's hard on everyone else. (laughs) They're just tough to be around. But I know they need Jesus, and I know the reason why they act that way is because they just need somebody to care about them. They just need somebody to love them. They just need somebody to look past their faults and include them. It's the shepherd, it's the pastor that can teach you to have that heart for the unlovely. As we walk into the world, Jesus says he's sending us out as sheep among wolves. As if only there was a way to to know the schemes of these wolves, to identify what these people are trying to do. There's there's these questions that are meant to to hurt my faith and and hurting the faith of other people around me. If, If only there was a way that I could provide these answers so the teacher comes in and teaches. But what we need to know about this is that there are just rooms that the evangelist is never going to go to. He can't be in your living room with your cousin. There are just places that the shepherd, that the pastor can't ever go. He's never going to meet your coworker. There's places that the teacher is not ever going to be invited. But you are. There's rooms that only you can be in. There's people that only you can talk to. And there's things that only you can do. And so God has invited you into this eternal plan and said, I need you to talk to these people. I need you to go to this place. And I need you to do this thing. And so that's how we see the work of the ministry. And so a lot of you have already paused right here said, Pastor, I agree with you 100%. The saints should be doing the work of the ministry, but I ain't one of them. So, Pastor, I know I'm saved, I know I'm redeemed, but I also know I struggle. I am not one of those saints. So I want to explain a little bit about who are the saints. There is a, a religious tradition that has used this word to mean something that isn't typically how it's used in Scripture. I'll just say it's the Roman Catholic Church. And the way that they use that term is that the saints are dead and live in heaven. And it's these people that have lived such an extraordinary life here on earth that they get special status Their life is examined, and then there's an expectation that after they die in heaven, they perform a miracle here on earth. And so once you have lived an extraordinary life, worthy of your life being mimicked, and then had a miracle performed after you die, then you get the title of saint. And it takes hundreds of years. It takes a long time. So there's this idea then in the culture that we've borrowed from that is to be a saint is to be this extraordinary person. Your life was perfect. You never struggled. Just you were best friends with Jesus and everything about your life is just emanating better than everybody else. And so just us regular folks, just us average folks, I'm not a saint. I still struggle. I still have my issues. I still have my flaws. And so I'm just not one of those saints. But that's not the biblical model. See, the Roman Catholic model is that saints are in heaven. Scripture says saints are on earth. Saint comes from the Greek word hagios, which just simply means holy or set apart. And Peter said in 1 Peter, you are a holy nation. I'll phrase it like this. If Jesus is your savior, you're one of the saints. It's that simple. You've been set apart and holy, not because you've done great work, but because Jesus has done great work. And in Christ, we're consecrated. In Christ, we're pure. In Christ, we're set free from our sins, and we are now sinless. You're one of the saints, which I find good news, but that now puts you on the hook to doing the work of the ministry. (laughs) So what is the work of the ministry then? Paul goes on, for the building up 
of the body of Christ until we all attain the unity of the faith, the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro. <coughs> Whoa. <coughs> oh, Pastor Rob, could you find me some water, please? Thank you, sir. So that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. So what's the work of the ministry? The first is the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain the unity of the faith. A church that, or a word that we might use for that is discipleship. The purpose of discipleship, the purpose of having lessons like this every morning, the reason why we're starting small groups, the reason why are we continuing in our faith is we are wanting to look more like Jesus. And as we look more like Jesus, we're going to grow in the unity of the faith. Thank you, sir. Pastor Rob, you're awesome. I get those five seconds off the clock. I get those back. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> so attain the unity of the faith. That's talking about all of us being in uni unity and belief. As we're working out these way of thinking about things, of approaching things, we still need to be unified in spirit while we're working out unity in mind. But we're all moving in one direction as a church. We're being unified and having the knowledge of the Son of God. We might call this getting people saved, evangelism. One of the things about being a church of impact and being a church of influence and having the saints do the work of the ministry is seeing people come to Christ, that they would grow in their knowledge of Jesus, and it starts with knowing that he has saved them. And so what is the work of the ministry? First, it's discipleship, which is a, it's a kind of a church word, being disciplined to look like Christ, being somebody that is in pursuit of being like Christ, and seeing people that don't know Jesus know Jesus. That's the work of the ministry. Now, a lot of you I know just got real nervous because all of a sudden thinking, uh-oh, is he about to send us out into the streets with Evangia cubes and like, what are we doing? First of all, Evangia cube is a wonderful tool. I've used that for a long time, uh, but sorry, I'm getting sidetracked. So first, there are people you are gifted. You are gifted with talking to strangers and getting them to know Jesus. I mean, you can talk to anybody and somehow it'll turn into a conversation about Jesus and you're gonna get them saved right there at the gas station or the grocery store, wherever you are. There are people that are gifted that way. You need to use your gift now more than ever. But not everybody might be gifted that way. And so I would say this, we all are gifted in bringing people into church. Bring them to church and then trust the Holy Spirit to get into their life, to talk with them, to, to show them who Christ is. If you'll be faithful in that, I am sure God will be faithful in the rest. Discipleship and evangelism. The next is maturity. Maturity is one of the works of the ministry. There's people you've been in church your entire life and nobody's ever told you this. Becoming mature is the goal of Christianity. That is why we are still here. That is what we are trying to do, is we are trying to mature. What does that mean? To look more like Christ, to think like him, to do things like him, to embrace what Jesus embraced. We are in constant pursuit of maturity, which is having the fullness of Christ. I get that I'm kind of weird whenever I think about this stuff, but have you ever thought about if the goal of Christianity is just to sit here and wait until you die to go to heaven. Why did God leave us here? It's hard being here sometimes. There's pain, there's sickness, relationships fall apart, there's stuff going on. If the entire goal of our faith was to just sit here and die, why did Jesus leave us here? There's, I know this is sick, a joke, but I, I just got to tell it every time. I have this impulse that I got to tell it. There's a reason why our prayer teams don't keep ball-peen hammers up here. Somebody comes forward, says, I've accepted Jesus as my Savior. Man, that's awesome. We love that. So, so Jesus is your Lord. You bet. 
So, so he's forgiven you of your sins. Absolutely. So you know that Jesus has saved you. You bet. Bonk. See you in heaven. I get that's crass. But why don't we do that? Because it's the mature that help in discipleship. It's the mature that lead people to the knowledge of the Son of God. It's the mature that God uses to execute some of the work of the ministry. So as we are in constant pursuit of maturity, we are constantly putting ourselves in positions so that God can use us. So why are we, why are we still here? To mature, to look more like Jesus. And then the last part of the work of the ministry is because there is to no longer be tossed by every wind of doctrine, human cunning, and craftiness, and deceitful schemes. I don't know if you guys know this or not, but there are people, even today, teaching false doctrine. False truths claiming them to be true. And it started in day one. Most of our New Testament has been written to deal with false teachers claiming that what they were teaching was true. There are false teachers running rampant in the church. And one of the reasons why we reach maturity, one of the reasons why the saints are at work is to combat false teaching, is to combat false truths. And Paul specifically says every wind of doctrine. It seems like every two years, a new way to approach something has blown in, and the cool kids are doing this, and woof, now the cool kids are doing this. But it's the mature in the body that keep us rooted and keep us grounded and say, God has called us to do this, and so this is what we're going to do. So we're not being tossed around to and fro. The image there is like you're standing in the waves of the ocean. You just can't ever get your footing, and you're just being tossed to and fro, unstable. But not only that, there's human cunning. There are people that are wanting to lead us, lead churches even, not for the sake of God, not for the sake of people, but because they see it as an opportunity to get power and money. And they're cunning. And it's the mature in the body that are supposed to so hey, that's not a leader worth following. That's not somebody who's preaching truth. That's not somebody who has God or us in mind. It's the mature. The work of the ministry of the saints is to identify those people and say, he's not good, she's not good. But then there's also the deceitful schemes. You know, there's people that want to trick us. They want to trick you. They want to trick the whole church. They want to get the church to do what they want it to what they want the church to do. They want to co-opt the church for their agenda. They want to link arms with the church so that we can influence what they want influenced, not what Jesus wants influenced. There's people trying to trick us. There's the devil that's trying to trick us. And again, once we've reached maturity, we can stand up and be not just for the church, but even for the culture, these voices of reasoning, these lights in the dark places going, they're trying to trick you. Don't fall for that. So that's the work of the ministry, discipleship, evangelism, maturity, speaking truth and love. So what's the result then? If we embrace this, if as a church we want to be a church that has more impact and we as individuals want to grow in our personal influence so that we as a church can grow as our corporate influence, what's the result if we do the work of the ministry? 15, rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, that's Jesus, oh, into Christ, from who the whole body joined and held together and every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it is built up in itself, up in love. So what's the result then if we embrace as saints the work of this ministry, the first is that we will grow in every way like Christ. We will begin to look like Christ, talk like Christ, want what Christ wants. We will start to see the things that Christ would want us to see in the way that he saw them, not just as individuals, but as a church. I mean, just imagine. Try to build this image in your head. 
What if you walked into this church and every single seat was filled with Jesus? I mean, every single, there was a, a separate Jesus in there. Would you think, man, that church, they're going to see some prayers answered. That church knows truth. That church knows how to be with people. That church knows how to care about people. That church knows how to love people because every seat is Jesus. Jesus is working in the inside of you. When people walk in, that's what they're going to see. Every seat is filled with Jesus. He's the head. We're the body. So we'll grow in every way like Christ, and then we'll be joined together. I love that imagery of the joints bringing the whole body together, and we will be joined together. We will be unified. We will work together, and then here's the great one. We'll be built up in love, specifically that the body will grow as it's built up in love. It's not growing for its own sake. It's not growing for its own name. It's not growing because growing is the thing that you're supposed to do. It's growing in love. It's growing in the love of Christ. It's growing in the peace of Christ. It's growing in the news of Christ. It's growing in the miracles of Christ. It's not just growing. It's growing because love is the message that we preach. When people come into the doors, they find love. When people need prayer, they find love. When people are looking for a small group, they'll be met with love. When we do it the way Jesus wants it done. And so my encouragement in, as we close this out, is to embrace this awesome position that Christ has given each one of us. It is not just a spectator of the eternal plan, but as a participant, as somebody who has a role to play, somebody who has a job to fill, somebody that has people that need them, a place to meet those people, and a need that those people have. You can meet it. Because as a church, as we want to grow, as we want to grow in our influence, as we want to see more and more impact, that's what it's going to take is the people of God loving more, praying more, doing more for the people that don't need it. Now, I want to celebrate those of you. I know that you work hard already. That's not what I'm saying. Some of you just need to know it's time. Now's the time. God's put something in your heart a long time ago, and you've just been waiting for the right moment. So I'll get to that one day. I'll execute that one day. I'll talk to them one day. I'll do that thing one day. Today is that day. Today is the day to get off the sidelines and into the game. Today is the day to engage in this eternal plan. Today is the day to say, God, I want to be a fellow worker with you. Who do I need to go to? Where do I need to go? What do I need to do? And when we do that, we'll start to see our impact and our influence grow for Jesus. Father, I am grateful for my brothers and sisters in the house. I'm grateful for every person that is participating online. And I'm grateful, Father, for anyone that can hear my voice, that you have called them into a specific purpose to do a specific thing at a time such as this. So my prayer first, Father, is that you would in it just light up in them what it is that they're supposed to do. What have you called them to do? Who, where, and what? Then, Father, I am grateful that you will show them just how gifted they are to do what you've called them to do. And then, Father, I pray continually that we as a church will always be on this pursuit, this pursuit of godliness, this pursuit of looking like Christ, this pursuit of being who it is that you've called us to be, not so that vine can become famous, so that Jesus can be glorified. So Father, I thank you for the giftings in the house. I thank you for the destinies in the house. I thank you that ministries are being launched right now in the name of Jesus. World impacting ministries are being seeded today. Father, people groups are finding their missionary today. Father, I thank you that new churches are finding their pastors from a seed today. Father, I am grateful that the work of the ministry can't be named, can't be identified. It can only be felt because as the saints, we're going to do the work. So, Father, thank you for giving us the ability. Thank you for giving us the calling. In Jesus, we pray. Amen. <laughs>